Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that You bless this time of meditation on Your Word, that You bless the words of my mouth and the collective meditations of our hearts, that they may be well-pleasing in Your sight, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Tone is important. Tone tells you what things mean when people say them. Let me give you an example. Hey, you! Hey, you! I use the exact same words, but clearly they meant something different because of the tone in which I spoke. One might have been a happy greeting from a longtime friend, the other an angry shout from a parent to a child, or you to a friend who you think did you wrong. You can tell a lot by the tone in which someone speaks. How about another example? Wow, that is so great. Wow, that's so great. Right? See, you get it. You understand almost intuitively that the tone of my voice conveys a different meaning even when I use the exact same words. Well, in our gospel reading today, that's the question I want you to ask yourselves. What tone is Jesus speaking in? Because it turns out it bears quite a bit on how you understand this text. Now, when I read this reading a moment ago, I went for a little bit of a tone of anger and judgment. Maybe you wondered a little bit why I sounded that way, right? Jesus says, hear another parable. Or when He asks them the question after He says the parable, when therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will He do to these tenants? And then when He quotes the Scriptures to them, have you never read in the Scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it was marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And even from the context of our reading today, anger would make some sense. Jesus has just entered Jerusalem to the accolades of the people, but then He's greeted in the temple with a scene which prompts Him to righteous anger for the misuse of His God's house of his father's house, and he drives out the money changers and flips their table. And then there's a short section of verses where he curses a fig tree and it withers. And now he's in the context of his authority being challenged by the religious leaders of Jerusalem. The same context as our reading last week was the first of two parables that he's telling the chief priests and the Pharisees. So Jesus could be saying this in anger. But what if I reread those verses in a different tone? Jesus said, hear another parable. And when He asks them the question after He says the parable, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will He do to those tenants? And then in verse 42 through 44, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God, it will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Did you hear the difference? Did you receive those same words but with a different understanding? While both readings of this text are possible, if we look at the text in its context, I believe the second tone is the more likely of the two readings of today's gospel reading, where Jesus is taking on more of a pleading, warning tone to the Pharisees and the chief priests. Now, the context, as I mentioned before, is Jesus has entered Jerusalem and He's done some controversial things, and His authority is being challenged by the religious leaders. 
But we also get a, a, an extra bit of context from our Old Testament reading today in Isaiah chapter 5. We have almost a parallel start to Jesus' parable with someone making a vineyard. And in both cases, the vineyard in question is Israel, the people of God. And He's done all the work to set the vineyard up for success. He's planted choice vines. Now, there's a few differences between the Isaiah reading and our gospel reading. You see, the issue in the Isaiah reading is the fruitfulness of the vineyard. These choice vines yield bad or wild grapes, not any good for the harvest. But in the gospel reading, the issue isn't the fruitfulness of the vineyard. It is those who have been placed to oversee it. The tenants of the vineyard are the issue. And we'll look at the significance of that difference in a moment. But you'll notice if you go back to our Old Testament reading, at the end, Jesus speaks words of judgment, starting in verse 5 of our Old Testament reading. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it." Now that could have been said in judgmental anger, or it could have been the lamentable condition and state of God's people, that in order to bring them to repentance, He's no longer going to protect them from the results of their unfaithfulness in the hopes that they will return to Him. And he expresses this sorrow in the verse prior when he says this, "'What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes?' In other words, I've done everything to set this vineyard up for success and it's not working. Well, as it it will become clear as we look at the parable in the gospel reading, God's working in the world is not like ours. Because if you really look at this parable, there's a lot about it that doesn't make sense. It seems like a very odd story, and most of the characters in it behave in a very strange way. But I want to give you a couple other scriptural examples before we jump into the parable to help you understand the tone that I believe Jesus is speaking with here. The first comes from Mark chapter 10, verse 21. And in this section of Scripture, Jesus is addressing a rich young man who wants to know what he needs to do to inherit eternal life. You're probably familiar with that account. Well, in Mark, there's something said in verse 21 where Jesus is about to tell him something difficult to hear, but it's clear that He does it in a loving way because the text tells us that He loves him. So, Mark 10, verse 21 reads, And Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. In compassion, Jesus tells him a difficult truth and then invites him to follow him just like his other disciples. But he goes away sad because he was unwilling to part with his possessions. But perhaps the strongest textual indicator that this is this pleading, warning tone is really what Jesus is speaking from comes in a few chapters later in Matthew, Matthew chapter 23. And in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus pronounces seven woes to the scribes and the Pharisees, the very people He's speaking to right now. And right after He says those woes, He speaks a lament, an expression of sorrow. And it reads like this. This is verse 37 of Matthew 23. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as hens gather her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. You can hear the pain in Jesus' voice through those words. 
He doesn't want the destruction and condemnation of the chief priests and the Pharisees he's speaking to. He wants them to be recalled to himself. He wants them to repent and cling to him. You see, you'll, you'll notice in many places in the Scriptures, but the Pharisees are probably the most famous example. They have set their minds on making themselves an enemy of Jesus, but He does not share their animosity. And I think sometimes pastors and, and churchgoers, we sort of put our own tone in there, that if I was treated this way by a group of people, this is the way I would respond, but Again, we know that God's ways are not our ways, and that the master of the house, it turns out in our parable today, behaves in a way from the Pharisees and chief priests' own mouths that we would not. So let's jump into the parable. Anytime you're looking at a parable, one of the first questions you're going to ask yourself is, who am I in the parable? Now, sometimes it's obvious, and this one is not one of those cases the answer to that question, who am I in the parable, is really not very straightforward. And given the context, most of the characters in this parable have a very obvious correlation. The vineyard is Israel. The tenants of the vineyard are the chief priests and the Pharisees being addressed by Jesus. The master of the house is God. The servants are the prophets and the messengers and the kings that have been sent to God's people. And the Son, of course, is Jesus. But that still leaves us, the disciples of Jesus, saying, who am I in this parable? We could be the wicked tenants, and maybe you've heard a sermon to that effect, but this role seems to be very specifically given to the chief priests and Pharisees whom Jesus is speaking to. And it's even called out more obviously at the end of our text today. No, we're not the wicked tenants in the parable, but rather, we're just going to be the disciples in the actual context that Jesus is giving the parable. They're standing there observing Jesus speaking to the Pharisees and the chief priests, and today so are we. And as we bear witness to the words of Jesus, His tone will make all the difference to our understanding of what He's saying and why He's saying it. Because either He's angry and we're His disciples thinking, that's right, Jesus, stick it to those Pharisees, those dummies, they never get it, and it serves them right the way they've been treating you. Let's see how they like it. And if you're like me, maybe you've felt that way when you read about the Pharisees in the Bible from time to time. Or as we have looked at already, we see a Savior warning in urgent tones to those whom He loves, those whom He wants to call back to Himself. So here we have a loving Savior warning His people of a coming judgment. Jesus is telling these leaders that they are not receiving whom God is sending to them. In fact, much worse than not receiving them or not listening to them, they have placed themselves in a dangerous position. They have made themselves enemies of the master of the house because they've mistreated, abused, and killed those whom He sent. This is where we begin to see the odd behavior by the characters in the parable. Most of all, the master of the house, either he's so weak-kneed and afraid that he doesn't know what to do about the situation, or he has an impossible amount of patience for wickedness. Because he sends a first group of servants, and they're, the text says that they're mistreated. It says in verse 35, and the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Now, what would you do in response to that? Well, the master of the house sends a second group. Who would do that? You think, they've blown their shot. There's no way. I don't understand any of this. This is evil. They need to pay. But the master of the house sends a second group of servants. And the same thing happens to them. Verse 36, again, He sent other servants more than the first. So not only is He patient, but He's increasing in His generosity and love for the tenants. And they did the same to them. 
mistreated, killed, stoned. But then, even if you had a lot of patience, this next part, there's no way any of us would do it. Then he says to himself, I will send my son to these tenants who have mistreated and murdered the others I've sent to them, and all he does is say, well, they'll respect my son. Based on what? Because the way that they treat the servant is reflective of how they feel about the master. Because he's coming, bearing, he's coming to them bearing the master's authority and on the master's mission. Well, who does that? Who sends their son to such people? Turns out, God does. And what do they do? In their greed, they think they can get the inheritance that belongs to the son by killing the son, and so they do. So Jesus has laid out this parable, this hypothetical, and then He asks them a question. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And the Pharisees at this point, you can only, we can only imagine they don't yet know that they're the tenants in the story because here's their response. They respond the way we would given the situation in the vineyard. They say, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. They deserve to be killed and to lose possession of what has been given to them for what they have done. And then Jesus takes their own words of judgment and enlightens them to the fact that they're speaking about themselves. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the Scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? that this was the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits, and the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. Now, me, the disciples, watching Jesus interact with the Pharisees and the chief priests, it can be easy to revel in the judgment of God as one who's observing it and thinking, I don't have to worry about that. I've got Jesus, but these guys, they're getting what's coming to them. It's easy to revel in that. And the disciples, they may very well, as sinful human beings, been taking some joy in the misfortune of the Pharisees and the chief priests as they hear Jesus lay into them, because, man, you could think of this as a really elaborate trap of words for Jesus if He's trying to one-up His opponents. He just got them basically, in the harshest of terms, to condemn themselves before they realize what's going on. But God, it turns out, doesn't revel in His own judgment role here, but instead laments. He doesn't want to judge His people this way but their actions have left him no choice. Even though he's been more gracious and long-suffering than we could possibly ever imagine to be. Jesus is not happy that these men do not repent. He wants them to believe in him. Why do you think he kept sending servants and eventually his son? He wants to gather them back to himself. As disciples, just like they did in this instance so long ago, we are called to observe, bear witness to the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, mirror that compassion in our lives with other people. Just like our Lord did not make enemies of those who made enemies of Him, nor do we. We do not revel in the misfortune and judgment of others but instead, we look at a Lord who views that with compassion, who laments over the state of the situation, and does everything He can to bring them to repentance. So we are called 
to be moved by our compassion, a compassion given to us through the gift of the Holy Spirit, to lament over the judgment that is placed upon the wicked, and to do what we can to bring them to repentance so they too can cling to Christ. Because in Christ, that judgment has been meted out and has been taken in upon Himself. That's what He's in Jerusalem to do, and He already knows it. Our reprieve from judgment is not an occasion to enjoy the misfortune of those who stand in the judgment of God. Rather, it is to, like our Savior, be moved to warn and exhort to them of the coming judgment by pointing them to Christ and what He has done for them. So as you've heard today in song and in word, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Let's follow our cornerstone's example and be moved by compassion for those who stand in the judgment of God. Not because in doing so we become better people or better Christians or that we secure our salvation. Your salvation is already secure as a disciple of Jesus. But rather as those who now who have received the Holy Spirit are moved to an otherworldly compassion like the master of this vineyard like our Lord Jesus Christ, to exhort, to warn, to love, and to point all that we come across to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In His name, amen.